So, for those of you who have uh, followed the history of strong lensing from the SDSS to the end, you know that strong lensing is really, really hard. It's, it's uh, a tough challenge. And if you talk to anybody uh, who knows a lot about the field, uh, they'll tell you that, you know, it really is not going to be able to help with the and, and the Roman space also, but we're going to make progress in this problem. And if you talk to the same people now, who are the people in the field that can help you make progress? The one name that will pop to the top of the list that you consistently, if I were there, I'll call up the thing again. Simon Bidet is undergrad and graduate work at ETA as well, before moving to California, where he was supposed to occupation, he was not a trainer, yeah. if I remember right. And then, uh, IPAC fellow at Stanford, uh, where he actually worked alongside Kurt Barrow. Uh, and now he's a faculty member at Stony Brook. He has been the coordinator for the DES Strong Lensing Group, the LSSD Dark Energy Science Collaboration Strong Lensing Group. He's led one of Holy Cow's key analysis. He's, he's, if, if you want to know about strong lensing, you'll hear it from that. So that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you, everyone, for coming and being so nice. Uh, make this a really pleasant day for me. Um, this presentation is hopefully for you, and if not, this ad really is meant to uh, be, be for you. So whenever you have questions, strong lensing is a lot to cover. I cannot go through all things, and the title is Ambitious, From few to a Thousand. So I wanna highlight on one side where we are now with what is, <laughs> So really, you know. The dark and the light comes out. Um, where we are right now, when we are. Yeah. Yeah. Where we are right now, with mostly analysis done, is a one to 20 system. That's the number you should have in mind. Uh, what the type of science, exciting results actually we have already nine right now. To offer. That's a one. And then I look in the very nearby future where these numbers are drastically going to change. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And how can we go there? Hopefully it makes you excited. I'm certainly excited about the next few years, for sure. And to start, um, we have, um, whoops. yeah, um, this is an animation. And hopefully you see that with light, light basically emitted on a galaxy, it gets here in one plane lensed around. And then when we look at it from the uh, face on, we see an arcade what's called an Einstein ring. So distorted image where multiple solution access for photons can travel that hits the detector or our eyes. And so when we see multiple images of the same source, we call it strong lensing. When we can barely see the distortions uh, in the image, it's weak lensing and the, the thing in between is intermediate length. I focus mostly about the strong lensing part and you see it all with that image here, the beautiful James Webb Space Telescope image where you see uh, dozens of sources that get multiple image and, and wrapped around. It is really an effect of general relativity. Um, and we can describe it also with a diffractive index so we can have glass, I don't have one here, where you can mimic this type of, of lensing effect with uh, a material that has a certain uh, diffractive index, so meaning the light speed travels slightly slower within, and so it bends. Light is always seen locally, but if you look from outside, blocks are ticking slower in the potential density, and so this means from outside we perceive a smaller light speed, and hence the change in light speed leads to this length. So it's really a classical optic lensing equations that we uh, use here to describe this phenomenon. And so here, this is a movie made by Yashir Herjava. You see multiple pictures <laughs> appearing and disappearing. And this is really here in that sense of another diffractor where yeah, water has a slightly diffractive index. And, and this happens. It's not quite the matter distribution of the universe <laughs> and the sources behind are also a bit more exalt or a bit different, uh, but yeah. That's the same. Um, so 
I want to go through a few topics here of what we do with these lenses when it comes to uh, cosmology, when we measure distances, scales, expansion rate of the universe. And the first uh, application here is uh, a measuring absolute distance with time delay, what we call time delay cosmology. So how does this work? Is we have the source, in that case, for example, a quasar, can be a supernova, but come to that, that uh, has a foreground galaxy, often a massive place to the galaxy, and its light gets bent around, the, in that case, four images appear from that same quasar, and that quasar sits in a galaxy, so we have the underlying galaxy that gives this tiny dead wing like uh, structure around. These, the path length is from geometrically different. So if it's, it's not exactly symmetric uh, aligned, you have one path that is longer than the other. And so light that is longer to travel through one path than the other, that's one aspect. The other is also when the light travels through, it experiences time dilatation, the Shapiro effect, the PR effect. And so it gets differently delayed depending on how deep in the potential well it is. So two effects, but bottom line, that these difference in path length uh, leads to a different arrival time. So if something flickers or explodes, we see it first in one image appearing and then in, in the other. And these delays are of order a day to 100 days, roughly on these galaxy uh, scale images. Uh, a, when we measure, we can measure this time delay here, basically this guy, a, what, how can we predict this delay? On one side, what this is, here's an optical equation, the Fermat potential, it has to do with angles on the sky that you see, so we need a lens model. So no, where's the matter? And the other part in this equation is these differences in angular diameter distance. So effectively what this is an absolute distance, as a unit of megaparsec, yeah, just meters. Um, and so if we then, measure the time delay, have a model of these distortions that happen to produce these four images and all the extended pattern, we can turn it around and effectively make a statement about the scales of the universe. You can think of it if we uh, have a shorter universe, so when every, all the distances are uh, shorter, then these time delays are shorter too. While the same system, we see the same angles on the sky, but the distances are different, you have a longer time delay. So, that's what an absolute distance is. And we can turn the absolute distance into a Hubble constant by stating the Hubble constant is the current expansion rate of the universe. And so if the universe expands faster, all the distances are shorter to a certain rate. So one over scale is the Hubble constant. And so everyone talks basically about the Hubble constant, but they effectively measure our distance. It's true for supernovae, effectively, and so that what are scales and you absolute scales. So here's an example of one of the famous lenses here, uh, which I know the telephone number of. And here this is a light curve through yeah, more than a decade, where you may see it here, light flickering. Uh, here, this is an animation, but the, the actual measurement points are, are true in terms of flux that flicker this quasar, and we can then measure these fluxes, line them up here, uh, report the times, and then it's a game about curve shifting, basically of, of aligning them to get the time delay. There's some other effects in there that cause variability, uh, like microlensing and so on, but you may already buy, uh, I see what they say here, how much you may wanna, wanna shift the curve, and you're probably good to a few days already, just by eye in that case. This is a very good example. So that's how we can measure the time. So where are we not right now? The, the Holy Cow plus Strides collaboration, now it's known as TD Cosmo collaboration. So we, we evolved, we have another name, but effectively these are seven systems that we have analyzed and we have the multi-color, all-color images uh, of those that have been added here. Um, and these are the individual posteriors on the Hubble constant for each individual one. They stack up here, and the black line is the combined curve that we get from these measurements. And these are presented in 
uh, uh, form it all. That's it. Here, I put here some assumption that every lens is independent, not only the data, but also the model assumptions we make in there. And there are model assumptions, and we assume it's a specific mass density profile family when we do this analysis. I'm not going into the detail, but we may be off for all the lenses the same or similar way in one or the other way that may be systematic scales. But this is here, the numbers game, seven lenses, they all consistent with each other. Then we combine them and get uh, about a 2% measurement of the whole point in that regard. And you see the, the number here, the high at 73 kilometers per second per megapulse. So that was the past. Since then, things have evolved a bit. So we have uh, made a new name. TD Cosmo now, so all the papers that come out is are now under the TD Cosmo brand. What you see here on the top this is the Wong et al. Millen et al. paper. These go with the very stringent assumptions on the density profile uh, or, or, of the deflector of the massive elliptical galaxy. This may or may not be true, but there's not exact data that can tell us whether these assumptions are correct or not. And so what we then decided in uh, TD Cosmo 4, uh, the paper is allow only the kinematics, and I come to that, to break what's known as the magic degeneracy. We're very relaxed assemble, assumptions of what the density profiles do and just ask what can the data actually tell us. And the data in that case are motions of star in the perfect. So how we measure this dispersion. And if you relax assumption, usually what happens, your error bars increase. And that's exactly uh, what, what happened in that regard. They increase, but the mean roughly stays the same. It may or may not have been expected, but it's just losing. What we then did in various steps, added new data. So we have a relaxed assumption, okay, but now how can we fix it? Or how can we actually have data to tell us more about what's actually going? And what we did then, we turned to another sample of lenses, slack samples of lenses, uh, which doesn't have time delays, but which has kinematic state that where we can tell what is the density profiles. And we used this external data set, added it on top. And what happened if you add it is the error shrink to a certain part. That's what we expect. We add data. And the mean in that case moved by almost uh, one thing, just within about the expectation where the data can, can steer us given the previous answer. Coincidence or not? Hard to say at that at that moment, um, but that's the current published uh, part here. Yeah. So it is a very brief run where I could have given an entire colloquium up about a data aspect here. Also exciting. I think you can close the little. Yeah, yeah. Is lens supernova? So this is a younger field. Quasars, uh, lens quasars we have, you know, discovered since the, the 90s or even the first uh, doublet was in the late 70s. It's gold, in fact. Is your transient lens supernova? In here, there's three examples. By now, we have five confirmed. Lens supernova, uh, or not a really big number, but I, I'll come to that in a second. So we have here MGM 10138. This is uh, a supernova that we had. Uh, unfortunately, here the delay is about 10 years. So it's very long to wait uh, to, to, uh, to, get, to get the science done. On the other hand, we have this uh, lens here that was stored in CPF survey. Uh, that has very this is 0.1 arc seconds so a very small image separation and unfortunately here the time delays are very short and so we cannot really measure the time delay um from from this one here the really jackpot in that case uh, supernova rest uh, was discovered in uh, 2014 where this color image here uh, was taken. And what you see here are four dots, S1, S2, S3, and S4, right? 
little yellow dots that are four images of like a quad configuration. Uh, and it's in that spiral arm feature of that galaxy. And that galaxy here also appears here and over here as well. But the time delays are such that we only see image of one appearing. And when the team is discovered these, they uh, went to lens models and say like, hey, when do the images of the others appear? And it turns out for this one, we are too late. If you had pointed Hubble in the late 90s, we may have discovered it already there. Now it's gone. But about a year later, we expect the image to appear here in that same spiral apart here in another image. So what then happened is every month or so, Hubble was taking images to not miss it. And in early 2016, this image here appeared here, here, here the, uh, one single band. And so what since the team uh, did, did a blind, did not tell when it's actually the peak of this image so that we don't really know the, the time delay or it's blinded. The, the models got, got uh, re revised with all the information that were in these images and a lot of spectroscopic data, and they gave predictions. And then we compiled them, and this, this spring we actually published the Hubble constant from it, combining length model and, 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 and time delay. And supernovas are uh, good because they have a very characteristic light curve. It's not some random uh, damped random walks or something. It's really, we know they rise and they fall in a specific way for some supernova better than for others. They, and they fade away. So we can also do better kinematics measurement. We don't have bright laser lights contaminating, contaminating a lot of things. And we can use them as standardizable magnification in the case of type 1a supernova. So we Standardizable in essence, if we have an idea of what the apparent luminosity of this uh, supernova is without lensing versus with lens. And the difference is the lensing magnification. So that is a way we can uh, break some of the genesis. And put, yes. But wouldn't that be a very long, because I give it the way that what lens can evolve? So, we don't need to wait. So if you have a type 1a supernova, we know roughly how self-similar they are. So say if we have a spread of 0.15 dex or so, and they use that as the standardized from nature. We just have other supernovas that are not lens and compare those. Simon? Simon? Oh, uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead first? Okay. Uh, yeah, Simon, thanks. This is cool. So. Um, for the lens supernovae, do you see the host galaxy underneath it? Um, is it also lens? Yes. So in the case of supernova restal, clearly, yeah, we see the, the spiral features a lot that help us also to locate and predict the lens model. Uh, for the, the IPTF 16GE, uh, we see it in the AO image, um, not so much in the HSE, so it's, it's harder to see. So usually if we very very uh, deep, we will see eventually a host galaxy, yes. And often we see. And how much do we have to worry about microlensing in the host galaxy itself, also brightening the supernova and therefore throwing off effectively the time delay measurements of the distance pattern? Um, quite a bit. Not so much for the time delays. Time delays are not or a sub day impacted by microlensing. What it throws up is this the light curve magnification. So we cannot use the standardizable magnification if you don't know the microlensing. And you can throw up the shape of the light curve because the, the ejecta evolves with time. So it, it expands, that's what supernovas are. And so the microlensing effect will change over the time. So your light curve may have a bit of an oddly shape, but often the overall peak, uh, you, you just have what we did effectively here. We marginalized over a few dozen different micro lens and injected light curves and see how well we can still recover the time delay. For in that case, it's like a year's time delay. The micro lensing is below, you know, a fraction of a day, then we don't have to worry for that. But yeah. Yes. So 
This here is now from, uh, from Kelly et al. from the recent Rest al. paper that summarizes a bit the current stage, or it's one figure that summarizes a bit the current stage of measuring the Hubble constant with time results. So what we get here is, is one length supernova. So there are two, uh, all the models are only the two best models to be included. It's about 65 or 66 plus minus 5% measurement. And here we have the, the result of the holy cow by like Stephen Cosmo collaboration where this is seven lens equators with high assumption on the lens model and we if free them up and add 33 galaxy galaxy then we get uh, this model and here you have you know, shoes uh Carnegie Chicago I think no project etc so they definitely select and fun and any 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 CMB uh, yes Based on the error bars and the number of data points, would you say it's definitely too early to assume something right. systematic about the difference in the sort of potential values when having galaxy versus the length quasars alone? Yeah, so the biggest question mark that I have, I mean, I, I like the studies, but you still have the question mark is are these additional galaxies self similar enough with the ones where we have the time to them? So if we, if we add data that is not representative, your bias, no, that's a danger. But we are now really in the process of updating and adding a larger sample at different redshifts that are better matched to the ones where we have to be quasars and effectively redo the entire analysis. Yeah. So that is a question mark we have. Uh, when we did the entire analysis, we did it blind. We didn't know about any of the effects. We just decide which data we add on the which assumptions. We checked whether the, the, the goodness of fits, et cetera, that the models are consistent. And then we unblind and then for whatever reason we move mm -hmm. in one particular direction. All right, so that's about time delay cosmography right now. One and seven and HN uh, plus uh, um, 33 galaxy galaxy length. Another measurement we can do with strong gravitational lensing is the relative expansion history. And here, an example here, this is a now a triple source plane lens. So it used to be a double source plane lens. So what do you see here? You see a massive elliptical galaxy in the center, and then we have one source that leads to the uh, one um, better arc that is at relative 0.6. And uh, there's a second source a fainter that is at roughly relative 2.4. And so here's kind of like a diagram what may happen, how it looks like. Is it a lens and then two sources at two different uh, distances or regions? And there is a ratio between what the apparent Einstein radius is, or the apparent reflection in the sky, depending on the distance from lens to, to the different sources. And so if you move the source effectively at a different distance, you you widen or shrink the, the Einstein radius relative to the angular dimension. And so if you just have one deflector, you must assume quite a bit about the physical mass density. But if you have two, you can do a ratio of them. And that ratio here between you know, the alpha one of alpha two is actually a function of a product of four angular diameter distance. This is a ratio, this is not an absolute scale, but effectively it traces the relative expansion history of, of the universe. So it's tomography. So people do a very similar thing with weak gravitational lensing when they have redshift bin and they ask themselves, well, how did the lensing signal change when they walk through the bins? And here we can just do it right in one lens, we get a ratio uh, on it. And here, this is from that one lens, it's already uh, a bit older, uh, one double source plane lens. Here in case of omega matter and, and, and the equation of state parameter of dark energy as kind of like an extension model. You see it's not so precise, but there's clearly certain trends. And in particular, uh, the shape of the posterior is more or less orthogonal to what uh, like a Planck posterior in that space looks like. So, and this is, yeah, one lens, that's it's a lucky shot at that. 
And what I have also to mention here coming back, so this is two, and <clears throat> there happens to be in this one with news uh, that follow spectral line emission at here at redshift about six, uh, that may have a counter image here. And so if you go even deeper and deeper, every galaxy to look, you look is what has one or two lens planes behind, but just something that it means like. So when we talk is something a lens or not, we have to specify actually how bright we make a cut of what are it means. So that that you have to keep in mind. And with JWST, we we can yeah put deep imaging and spectra on a on on a few of these systems. Yeah. So what we can also do to measure the relative expansion history, and it is here uh, the picture from the Riefen van Dokkum uh, 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 paper that, that came out, is comparing two different masses, the lensing mass and the dynamical mass. And the dynamical mass is you know, how fast are uh, stars, tracers moving in the potential. And so here we can get an Einstein radius estimate effectively, and maybe some, some additional lens parameters. And here, what we effectively do, very hard to see from the spectra, is we measure absorption lines in the stellar spectrum and, and the width of them, which correspond to the dispersion of how the stars move along the line of sight integrated. So if you get this dispersion width, you make it have a line of sight projected velocity. And so both are mass estimates, and we can take the ratios of those, how they are different, or basically we can predict the stellar velocity dispersion from the Einstein radius mass with some fudge factors. So one is the <laughs> one is the cosmological distance ratios involved, speed of light comes in, and then some function of basically your galaxy density profile, the stars, how, how they operate. It's a lot of astrophysics, put it in one part. And so we can use that to also kinematics and lensing together probe uh, uh, cosmology. So this is our three sets of how we probe absolute or relative distances. And they have been done with about order one to 10 uh, systems. Yeah. So the other part here, checking the time, is constraining small scale dark matter substructure. So here's another lens, probably a telescope. A group scale, and what you see here is from around P2, you get kind of a split here in the arc. And if you zoom in here, uh, here, here again, you have the split. And I could shield the blob, the light blob, and the trained eye might still guess that there must be mass that splits the light. So it, it, it shows that lensing doesn't require mass to be present to have distortion. So we really see it. Also, the total matter of foremost and also dark matter can store. And we can see here, we already know there's mass in here. It's probably, uh, you know, Milky Way size or whatever uh, a galaxy um, or, or slight, slightly less mass than the 11 or so. Um, but we can go down to a much smaller scale. And here, a few slides a bit more technical of how we can actually extract information that is on very small scales. Uh, if, so when we have source, it would be, look like this, intrinsic. We don't really know how it looks, but just they like it says. Yeah. We warp it. Uh, what the data looks, it's convolved, blurred, either brown based, diffraction, pixelized in the detector, and, and that's noise. And I have not even added here a deflector galaxy or anything else that comes with it. And the question we have is effectively, uh, how do we get the distortions? Small scales, the large scale given that. Huh? That's what we care about. That's what we need to know. So what is all the instrumentation doing? And here we have a lot of nuisances that we don't really know, but we want to marginalize all. Uh, that's a tricky game. How can this be done? And it just give you some examples of how it's been done in, in the past. And this is using a so-called semi-linear inversion. So whenever you can make something linear, a linear problem is more easy to solve than a non-linear one. And so whenever you see something linear algebra, it's really useful for that. So how can we linearize or semi-linearize the problem? For a certain proposed lens model, we can make a set of 
assumption in the source plane where you can introduce a basis that should in some sum or the other describe how the galaxy looks like. This can be pixels, this can be Fourier mode, so Fourier decomposed, or you can use decades platelets, which is something in between. But just like a finite set of wiggles or any kind of basis that are in that case orthonormal, uh, that superposition can mimic spiral galaxies or whatever you want. Now, each of these bases we can forward model through the entire step of the, of the diagram that I showed you before. We lens it, we convolve it, and then we do this for every single one, and then ask ourselves what linear superposition, they're not orthonormal anymore, but at least linear, but linear superposition of the set of these bases gives best fit to the data. And that's a linear problem. Once we have that coefficient, we can just evaluate the coefficient over here and we get that. And so this is the solution for the image that looks like that. And you do this over and over again. So that's kind of like what in the last decade or so has been, been developed and been used. And powerful, still computationally expensive. Yeah. So here's an example in action where I uh, run the simulation here, we have input image, the input source, and each time here, the polynomial order, the amount of bases we add increases. And the more and more you add, the better and better it describes source pattern. The image is basically perfectly fit. By now, it starts over fit. By now, so basically, okay. Here, I've cheated. I knew the answer of what the lens is. I just know I can marginalize over it roughly in the same speed as the movie goes, or even a bit faster. So, good. So, but what now when we introduce a dark clump into the model that I don't know that is there? Some slight little distortion that is not there. And the nuisance parameter just make another source and make the data look the same and, and can I ignore it? So let's run it. This distortion is very small. Um, and so at first, the reconstruction will basically do the same. It wants to just fit the spiral feature, the residual get, gets down. And um, by about now, you see certain residual pattern remain. And regardless of whether we add more bases, they kind of like stay. And what happened here? The fact that we have multiple images of the same source, you can fix one image by just changing the morphology, but you cannot simultaneously fix two images with the same morphology while not having the relative distortions correct. And so that's really a feature that is some degree unique to strong lensing that we can partially break this degeneracy between arbitrary source and arbitrary lens in that case. And that's just to kind of like give you a bit of an idea. Doesn't mean there's no uh, degeneracies at play here, but, sir, but that one here is, is broken. And this technique has been used and uh, another, uh, uh, aspect here is uh, unresolved source. And you don't see in that case, let's just say, image particle lens quasars, but we don't see visually distortion or it's not extended. So here we can zoom in, at least in the computer, and see this quasar here should more or less look like this. So extended, distorted, just on very small. Here is made by Daniel um, Gilman. And what in this movie happens, it drags a clump of matter through it, you can think the position of a dark substructure. And while it's doing that, it distorts the image on this side. And what's being reported here is the integrated flux in this cube or this pixel. It's the magnification, basically the integrated magnification mm -hmm. being changed. And here, percentage of it, when it comes close, it drops, it shapes, and then goes back when it's far away, that it basically doesn't have any effect. And so one image alone doesn't really, we don't know the intrinsic flux of it, so we cannot really do much, but we have multiple images, we get flux ratios. And so it, uh, if so, it happens that certain images have some very small perturber, the ratios get amplified or magnified or demagnified, here by for the 10% level for a mass of 10 to the seven. This is supposed to be below the regime where you expect galaxies to, to or stars to be formed in, in the potential level. And so we can measure things to that level for this for certain quasar um, uh, flux ratio. And this has been done, particularly here by a series of work with, with Daniel Gilman and, and Nuremberg, 
you do the same for eight quadrupoly length quasars, you're just a set of uh, six of them. And here we really do a statistical detection. We don't know where and if a clump is right there and what position for all the images, but we do Monte Carlo style, hundreds of thousands, millions of realizations of populations of dark matter and ask how much favored are these models relative to, to, a, to a, another hypothesis in terms of the reproduction of the flux ratios on the set of Nakhil 8 uh, quadrupoly lens quasars. And what you get here, the, uh, the crucial part here is this M half mode mass, so the half mode mass that can be translated in a dark matter warm, so to speak, the turnover in the power spectra. Uh, um, but also resulted in a damping of small scale structure and also the blockchain makes it less concentrated. And we can see here that we can rule out really strong damping in that case. And then up here somewhere, a one or two sigma uh, uh, constraint depended on what fires you use in that form. But we can get like uh, exclusive amounts, very or, or more dark matter. Yes. So my question is how much is like something like LSSD going to help in a picture like this? Because I would imagine that you need really high resolution to actually hope that find positions of stuff like this. But is the hope that just building a much, much larger sample of these lenses in the first place will outweigh the kind of high resolution that you need to detect these type of perturbations? Um, good question. So I come back to you here. What we use is not necessarily the high resolution imaging. What we use here is spectral line emission. So oxygen uh, free or some other a narrow line emission from a hot or medium warm torus. And so here we use actually spectra on flux density measurement in, in that case. So LSST alone will not do it, but as you said, like provides a sample uh, we can study uh, for this. And these uh, ones here were mostly detected in, in Gaia, Pan Stars, and the Dark Energy Survey and, and decals as well. Yeah, so this is eight and sample matters. Yeah, so this decade now, and it's not the next decade, it's really this decade. So uh, it's a bit scary, but you know, it's, it's coming up and some of them are actually running. So we expect tens of thousands of strong lenses of the type that, that is so about 200 plus ways of length. It may be even in the thousands, but the question is which ones are, are used for so the more smaller separated one. But let's say for the sake of argument, 200 relative to seven that we have. 50 plus length supernova per year should be in the data of LSST. Do we find all of them? Probably not. Uh, but it's there to be found, to be discovered for us to find ways to check to follow them up, to confirm them, it's, uh, they're there and they're coming up like popcorn on the sky, you know, <laughs> every year in, in that time. <clears throat> and these are the tools we have and will have in hand in different ways. Uh, James Webb telescope is already going on. I'm not really talking about uh, LVK, cover like a Virgo, uh, but gravitational waves can also be lensed. There may also be an opportunity uh, uh, to find Euclid and Nancy Grace Roman telescopes, we have space mission with sharp images. We have VLBI, NGVLA, SKA, et cetera. So the interferometry resolution, time domain with Vera Rubin and a very high resolution optical or near infrared, uh, ELT, TMT, GMT, fingers uh, crosses that these facilities we have or some of them we have access to. So how does the uh, near future look like or so? That's <clears throat> what we, for example, is examples in the dark energy survey. We find lenses, we find them already in the, in the hundreds or so on the, the current optical um, uh, surveys. Uh, we find also lens quasars too. So these are images of like discovery images that we put into proposals for them getting follow-up observations. These are, yes, these are all lens quasars um, of different types ground space images. And when we get the images from the Hubble Space Telescope, they may look like this. Uh, what you see here is always copies. Uh, one is the real data, and the other is a model we have for it. Uh, in a, in a, yeah. 
So that just shows what level in detail in, in the pixel. And this is not the, the cosmograde. This is just a bulk production of the models uh, that, that uh, students and our postdoc uh, and, and I uh, are doing in that way. Just a nice moment. Yes. Is there any physical reason why a lot of those images seem to have three dots on one side and the four on the other? Um, yes. So we have even uh, uh, a name uh, uh, for it. So it's a task configuration. It depends on where the source lies relative to, to uh, the deflector. And so there's a position in that where it leads to that configuration. Um, so you have one, obviously, that is magnified, and that is the most magnified. Roughly, is the rule that the, the sum of these two are roughly that one to first order um, here in very simplified configuration. These are also one of the easier to find. Then we have crosses that are rather symmetric when it's really behind it, and the deflector is a bit asymmetric. And it's the crosses. And then you have the fold configuration where you have two together and two a bit more split when it's uh, in 45 degree uh, rotated from the from the cost configuration. Probably. So, good observation. Yeah. So we follow them up and we have for some of them we have time delays, we have models. So a lot of them are in the pipeline to actually be used for time delay cosmology and we're excited to have them out in the very nearby future. So this is really active ongoing work. What's also ongoing work is spatially resolved kinematics. So we have a very better hand of what is the mass distribution in this galaxy. On one side, we have data from Tech, Cosmic Web, Imager, KCWI. Here, this is from Dutty et al. very recently, where here is the data, the 2D map of the dispersion along the line of sight that really helps us with the radial density profile, the, the anisotropy to constrain the type of systematics that we are currently limited to. And so we expect in the very near future, sub 3% Asian, certainly potentially even sub 2%, depending on how the analysis goes and what checks we have to do and uh, how much we have to throw, uh, or not throw away, but marginalize over. And very exciting in the TD Cosmo, uh, we are working on a new milestone paper in progress that incorporates all this. Data. It's been a while, and it's just hard work, but really we hope we can something put out in the next few months. Um, yes. Can you just elaborate with these things? Is this um is this like the, the image like is this image plane or source plane in the problem? Oh, this is image plane. Here we talk about the deflector, this the, the dispersion uh, of the deflecting galaxy. Oh, so they're the inside one. Yes. Okay. The, the, the lens uh, in that sense. Yeah. So, and this is I have so in people here. So we have basically a spectrum of every pixel at least with some <laughs> signal to noise, and then we bundle them together in so called Veroni uh, a bins, and then we compare it to models, and we have a certain receipt. Yeah. So we're working on a milestone. A lot of people uh, are involved in. And what's also exciting in cycle one. We have now data from James Webb Space Telescope, IFU. This is in progress. This is not the data, this is the photo of in that paper where we really get the, the crank out of it. So this is really up. What's also right now going on is uh, another JWST program for 31 length quasars to measure cold cells flux ratios. So I showed you the results eight, and here we get 31 more that each of them individually to be more precise, at least in the flux measurements that the ratios are very precise. And this should get us enough signal to noise to have sensitivity and, 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 and signal for structure below about 10 to the 6.5. So way below of what certain Milky Way satellite constraints are just because the they may not have stars at a low scale. So we can really probe and in, in that regime. And that's very exciting. That's a program is right now going on with 31 uh, lenses. Yeah. So how many lenses are there? So as I mentioned, like one or eight, seven, and then now 31 or, or, or 50 or so on in a quad uh, point. So here are some 
figures from different publications that here's the numbers, this is 10,000, 20,000 in each bin uh, as a function here of Einstein radius. Here, uh, the Euclid curve, and here LSST when you do depend on uh, what image quality uh, you, you have or, or try to search with. So it's just everything stacked together, only looking at the best one for some optimal configuration. And, and you see here, the numbers really stand up. Uh, LSSD is ground-based, so we're not gonna see much of the very small separation, even if they're there. Space, space, you can see that Euclid in that case, or here, Roman. And here really, it's also about how faint are they. <laughs> we go deeper and deeper, we see more and more and more. And here we did a study to characterize the ones where we can use substructure detection. That have enough signal to know the right part. And even there, there have been uh, pains in, in this. So we have, you know, a thousand or so uh, to deal with. So uh, we have now a, a dozen. Yes. So uh, I guess two related questions. So it still seems here that you're talking about numbers for each survey separately, but of course, you could combine LSST data with Euclid data and Roman data and presumably have higher resolution for deep blending. Absolutely. And modeling these lens systems seem fairly complicated. Are you going to tell us uh, how we might use AI or something? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. So this is, yeah, one is all, as you mentioned, all of them combining and then the question, how are we actually going to do it? And it's going to be the last part of, of this talk. <laughs> Uh, so one thing here, just before we actually go in the crux, is here a path towards like a 1% measurement in H0, which is kind of like the gold standard for, if we measure a 1% precision, be it 67 or 33, it's itself five sigma or more from the other uh, model, basically. So that's alone itself has the strength. And we can use here two or even more paths. I also think of both cleansing to calibrate it. Uh, but here, one is really going the spatially resolved uh, kinematics path. Oops, battery may die. Uh, spatially resolved kinematics with KCWI, JWST, uh, ELT. Um, and here we need about 40 to 50 lenses to go to that level with the wide assumption, the really pessimistic assumptions that are before that, so we can gain and overcome this decision. The other is with lens supernovae, if we can standardize them, or at least part of them, we can go within 10 years. Now, under some assumption of microlensing, and here comes it, uh, you know, where are we in this world? Uh, it's a bit of uncertainty, but it's maybe a really independent path of hunting down these type of systematics that are really different how we can deal with it. So we have multi-pronged approaches to how to combine and, and, and use this check for consistency. And both in that case lead to something like a 1%. At 1%, a lot of things gets very hard. That is just uh, what it is. On a log log plot, 1% is, is less than the thickness of the line you would plot. That's just to give you an idea. Yeah. Yeah. So how? Can we do it or yeah. potentially? So we have a lot of data and we want to be accurate and we want to actually be able to do it. And what I can tell if we were to do it the same way we did it five years ago, it needs more than one graduate year per lens. And that's even a little, this is small or it's more like two or three or so, I'll just give you an idea. So it would need a lot of, of me and, and other. So here's kind of like a schematic how we can do that potentially with HSD. And this is work primarily done at Stanford by the graduate students, now postdoc, and the Bachelor of Arabia, Art, and the best culprit. So we come up with, Bay or we use the Bayesian neural network. So neural network that gives us a posterior predictive model, not just tell a point prediction, but also an uncertainty estimate. So we get high resolution limit or resolution. We get a subset of posterior per lens one that is straight. Then we check whether the posterior is accurate on this uh, percentage of probability volume versus percentage of, of, of the of where the posterior lines. So how often is 60% of the true 60% of my posterior? Well, that's basically what a posterior state. 
and it should be around the one to one line. It's just a check of what it, the statistics we impose is actually the one through here. And then once we have that per individual lens on a certain trained assumption model that is most likely not the truth, we don't know what the truth is, we can do a population constraint on matter profiles and environment thousands of lenses by basically hierarchically sampling and see like what is actually the selection of the lens, what is the, the population level parameters underneath. So this hierarchical approach. And we can do that with this type of sample. Here, these are some of the papers where we've done it on mock data, just to give you an idea, but that's the, the spirit uh, we are heading to. And here's here, you can see, uh, mainly accuracy and the speed here is only because then we can do the loop over and over again, right? So we can go, and the next day or in next week, we can play the entire loop. Well, when we can only do it once, we can never be sure to be accurate under certain things. So here is an example of how can we do 100 to 1,000 lenses for, in that case, substructure. Uh, what you see here is the log of the halo mass of the substructure versus here the, the number density of this substructure here. Uh, you can think of warm dark matter when you have a turnover here, and here's just a measure of how much we have. What we do is we do a lot of training sets, like the images on, on the side, feed lenses that the network has never seen before, and then do the full inference about how granular is our lens, how much structure is. And we can be very accurate here. And this work now in collaboration, also with Google research, where we expand that using. Jax is like the new thing, uh, differential pr programming language because these simulations are very expensive, a lot of top structure and all the stuff in there. And uh, we want to yeah, push that to, to the data as well in, in that response. So are convolutional networks up to the task? I put a question mark in it there because I don't have the definite answer to that, but we certainly have promises to see how far we can push it. Yeah. Then on the, that's on the theoretical testing sample side. On the other side, actually, how do you deal with the data? You learn a lot when you touch the data, it gets dirty, it gets, you know, other problems come up. And here, as an example, DES as a precursor to LSD. There's been done a lot of work within DES. People here and in Chicago, Rob Morgan, uh, for example, search for lens supernovas. Uh, with spatial temporal neural network, and simultaneously you're feeding a series of images and, and find both the lensing configuration and potentially a transient that matches the supernova. And we have citizen science uh, projects where visual inspections being bulk done by thousands of uh, citizens. Um, and there's actually a paper on Palette on Fred by ES, where we, it's pre selected neural networks search from 10 million down to something like 40,000, which is a lot down, but 40,000 is still too much to find a spectrograph on each one of them. So we put in two citizens, we have measurement of the Hubble constant where we play the game of this length was found in ES, followed up by a, a collaboration agreement with Strides. Um, we have projects on searching for bright arcs, more groups of clusters. Can we use the arc statistics? and search for quarter polylens tracers. And like the last part is we want to move that to LSST. So all the learnings and most of the learnings, and this is the postdoc that works with me, Narayan Kafka, first name Narayan. <laughs> uh, and here's a, just an example of what we had a week ago in EP0.2 uh, uh, injected uh, lenses where we really want to have a high quality simulation and realistic simulation product that we can use to validate, to test, and, and then move towards data. Because that's the main bottleneck in many of this. And you can contribute, you can use it. It's in high development. Uh, here's the, it's a link a bit of the joint LCT Dent and Strong Lending Science collaboration, where we really move together uh, this task for this task. Um, I skip this part, but I want to mention here is also we can use galaxy clusters with JWST to look for very small scale substrate. This hasn't really been done so much, but it's so pristine images. For example, here's three images 
the same source, you have to cut out the of those. And they have to all come from the same source. And then we can do the relative distortions between those to see whether there's some type of tilt or something going on that hints for some dark substructure. And here, this is with uh, a single metal published where we use a, a very local basis of the deflector. We don't have to deal with all the complexity of the cluster, where we can model simultaneously multiple images and see whether we can find small tail substructure and, and measure them to the pixel <laughs> level on, on clusters. That's also something that seems new that I want to highlight here. Yeah, software. Uh, I'm really an advocate for open source. Some of you may use it. Uh, astronomy has a user community. I don't know about count 200 plus people. It's hard to count, really. Uh, 32 direct contributors. Etc. Do it, and it's it's grown. It's now community supported. And with that, here's a short summary. So, uh, gravitational lensing is it's a unique window in the dark universe. That's the main focus of the talk: dark matter, dark energy. We could have already done another talk about other things. And it, it probes small dark matter structures, so the small scale, but particularly also dark. It provides an independent anchors on cosmological scale absolute as well as relative scale. Uh, it's competitive with all the cosmological probe at this stage with relatively few systems uh, that are presented. And it's really advanced with increased sample size and improved observational capability, both resolution default, sample size default, and here limited by how we do the analysis. Very similar. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you say more about the class like Google? You're working with Google on the AI. Oh, yes. Um, yes. So that was uh, Sebastian Wagner Carena, who now started a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia CCA. He did last summer an internship at Google Research, where they let him try out the latest neural networks, where they have almost infinite computing on the problem of dark matter substructure. And through that, it turned <laughs> out that these models are very, very data hungry, but they need a lot of training, a million, more than we can store. And so what then they decided while doing that is they recode it into jacks that the training is during runtime. So the images are being produced during runtime and that how we can scale up. And Sebastian came back from his internship, but kept working with two people at Google over one a week, a one hour telecom. I mean, the, the work is led by Sebastian, who is host of astrophysics with Molly, uh, but with uh, Adver, Advise and Reese. Could you go to the second last slide where you were discussing substructure? Yes. Yeah. So you're saying those three are the same structures, like those three images are the, of the same one. Yeah, these are images of the same source. Same source. So how do we know that they are the same source? And a good question. So on, on one side, how we can know is with, with spectra. So the spectra looks identical. Okay. And the other is here, we even know it in that sense better that we find a distortion model that matches. And we know that the magnification here is higher in that direction than, for example, here. And so from a morphology, there is a bit knowledge so embedded. Mm -hmm. yeah. So another question on the back, and then we'll do it. Um, I do have many of the uh, manuscripts in this case, which goes back to the engineering tomography. Uh, but my question is how do the manuscripts in this case affect the dark matter and substructure? Um, good. Yes. So the answer is not much, luckily. So the mass sheet defense is effectively a focusing or defocusing of, of the light rays that you cannot know when you don't know the intrinsic size of the source. You just make everything a bit focused or, yeah. or larger or smaller. And when it comes to substructure, what you really probe is the relative distortions. And the relative distortions are very localized and they cannot match by a focusing or default. So if you have the wrong focusing, your mass estimate of the substructure is a few percent off. And a few percent off in the mass estimate is really not much 
when we talk about log scales of mass, is it 10 to the 9, is it 10 to the 10, is it 10 to the 7? So in that sense, it's a really almost neg neglectable part. So um, I think the bubble constant stuff with lens supernovas, um, I mean, the proof of concept is already really cool. And to extend that to something like with LSST is really exciting. Like it's best thought to get like 3%, 2%, maybe 1%. But uh, my question is, how confident do you feel in those measurements within the context of like the Hubble tension? Um, you know, where there's different methods get you different measurements. And I mean, to get like a 3% or 2%, obviously is a, is a, is a much tighter constraint than, um, you know, what most people get from like, Typical PPs and stuff like that. So, how, how would you actually, uh, like, how do you plan to reconcile whatever value you get there? Because, you know, you're going to you're gonna be in disagreement with somebody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, it is hard. So, what we do here at the collaboration is we do the analysis blind, meaning we don't know where it ends up. We have to agree on what are the uncertainties. It can be high or can be low, and we did it for these. Any of these are actually done blind. And at least then it's like, oh, we are at 66 or 67. Oh, let's stop now because we're good, right? Or let's say 73 and you stop unconsciously or consciously because you think you arrived to the answer. That's exactly not what we want. And so that's why we blind it. And it's scary. So I've done it twice myself, let it. It's, the results could be 100 or 50 that literally can come out. Uh, of it. So our yeah. bound is somewhere between like 40 and 150 for some other code blocks in <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and so that's one way that helps us guide on what we think are the uncertainties that we report. Are we always correct? Well, that's the game in town here, right? Mm -hmm. So with systematics, it's like we do as much as we can, we're challenging ourselves. I said like, I, it's a nice measurement, but I'm not 100% sure that the assumptions are correct. Let's break it up and see what else can we do here. Um, that's the answer I can give now. Hopefully in a few months, I can give you another answer when we unblind, something that we worked a long time, that I hopefully have a bit more confidence to tell you a bit more. Is that shape relevant or free? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are more questions for Simon, but uh, if you'd like to join us for dinner, you can always ask him over that. Uh, let's thank our speaker again.